My name is Christopher Adams, and I'm the rector of St. Paul's College at the University of Manitoba. I want to thank Sister Susan Lakeem and St. Mary's Academy for opening their doors to us this evening and welcoming us to their wonderful new alumni hall. I wish to note that this auditorium and the forks in downtown Winnipeg sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. St. Paul's College acknowledges specifically that we are in Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis people and the Métis nation. To honor the memory of Father Char John Charles Hanley, 40 years ago, friends and colleagues from St. Paul's College and the Department of Religion at the University of Manitoba established the Hanley Memorial Lecture Series. And beginning in 1980, each year this series is brought to Winnipeg a prominent theologian, scripture scholar, or speaker on current religious issues. This year will be no different. We have a very prominent speaker tonight, which I'm very pleased to see, uh, Catherine Clifford here. John Hanley was born in Winnipeg in 1910. He entered the Society of Jesus in 1933 and taught in Jesuit schools across the country, including Campion College in Regina, Loyola College in Montreal, and in Winnipeg, St. Paul's High School and St. Paul's College. He fostered in his students an interest in poetry, drama, music, public speaking, and above all, theology. Three of his greatest interests were the works of William Shakespeare, Gerard Manley, <coughs> Hopkins, and Tilao de Chardin. However, theology was his principal concern. Perhaps his most enduring contribution to the study of theology was his role in establishing the Department of Religion at the University of Manitoba. For the 2014 lecture, we are exceptionally pleased to welcome Dr. Catherine Clifford to give her three-part lecture. Tonight, Dr. Clifford will speak on Journeying Together, Ecumenism in the 21st Century. And tomorrow at 1.30 p.m., Dr. Clifford will engage the audience at St. Paul's College with a lecture titled, Where is the Church of Christ? Vatican II's Recognition of Other Christian Communities. And later on Monday evening at 7 p.m., she will give her third and final lecture, which is titled Ecclesial Recognition Today. There will be parking at St. Paul's College in the afternoon for the afternoon lecture. There's a parkade behind the college, and in the evening it's free parking right across the street from St. Paul's College. So today at St. Mary's Academy, and tomorrow at the college itself. I would like to express our appreciation for the generous funding support received from those who are the initial donors and organizers of the Father Hanley Endowment Fund, and I'm glad to see Don McCarthy here, who was one of those original founders of the Endowment Fund, and he's been very active in, in getting us to understand Dr. Clifford's literature, and he's an important member of our uh, community. I want to also thank the University of Manitoba for its continuing support through the Jesuit Academic Funding Agreement. I also want to thank more recent donors who continue to help this lecture series stay alive. Please be aware that photos and videos will be taken at this lecture and afterwards as the evening unfolds. The video of this lecture will be available online through the college's website at a future date. And also the washrooms are just outside the door and downstairs and there are also washrooms across from the cafeteria. I'm almost done. Now I'd like to introduce you to His Grace Archbishop Richard Gagnon. He was, he was uh, uh, installed at St. Mary's Cathedral at the beginning of this year. Ms. Grace will be installed as our college's new chancellor on April 6th at St. Paul's College in the Christ the King Chapel, an event to which you are all invited on April 6th. We are very pleased to have Ms. Grace here this evening. Ms. Grace will say a few words before we commence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, um, it's my distinct uh, joy, distinctive joy, to have been invited to introduce uh, to you our special guests for this evening on behalf of St. Paul's College for the Hanley Memorial Lecture Series. Now, <clears throat> having been introduced uh, by others over the past few months as your new Archbishop, it is now my turn to introduce someone. <laughs> and perhaps that's, that's a sign of my Winnipeg integration. I don't know. Please God, it will be. 
Professor Clifford, Dr. Clifford, is, as you may have read, Professor of Systematic and Historical Theology and uh, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Theology at St. Paul University in Ottawa. She holds an, a, a licentiate in theology from the University of Fribourg in Switzerland and a PhD in theology from the University of St. Michael's College, Toronto. And uh, she will speak to us tonight uh, within the general theme of the Hanley Memorial Lectures. And that theme is encapsulated as Pope Francis and deepening Catholic ecumenical commitment, learning from recognizing other churches. And our specific topic tonight, as has been mentioned, uh, for this portion of the lecture, we'll be journeying together ecumenism in the 21st century. Dr. Clifford's special interest, I believe, has been in the area of ecclesiology and ecumenism, and her doctoral thesis was on the group des Dames, a dialogue of conversion. An intriguing topic, actually, about a significant initiative, still active, which began decades ago at the Abbey Notre Dame des Dames near Lyon. Its special approach to its spiritual approach rather to ecumenism, inspired by the great ecumenist Father Paul Coutier, and engaging certain notables such as Yves Congar, is an important piece of the historical ecumenical landscape and not without significance in the framing of the Second Vatican Council's approach to the ecumenical question. In fact, our recent lecture on the Council, entitled Decoding Vatican II, Ecclesial Self-Identity, Dialogue and Reform, was given by Dr. Clifford a year ago as part of the Madaliva Lecture Series at St. Mary's College, Notre Dame University in Indiana. In fact, I believe that Vatican II itself is another area of special interest of Dr. Clifford, as she is the director of the Research Center on Vatican II and 21st Century Catholicism at St. Paul University. I think at a time when uh, ecumenism itself needs a bit of a boost, Tonight's speaker will give us a useful context in which to view this essential subject that they all be one as our Lord prayed for. And I think as, a, as an aside also, Blessed Pope John Paul II, in his frequent references to this question, once said, as his body in the unity which is the gift of the Spirit, she, the church, is indivisible. The reality of division among the church's children appears at the level of history as the result of human weakness in the way we accept the gift which flows endlessly from Christ the head to his mystical body. We are indeed fortunate tonight to be given this time to focus and reflect on our theme of journeying together, ecumenism in the 21st century. Reverend fathers, sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Catherine E. Clifford. Thank you very much, Your Grace, for your introduction. And uh, thank you to um, uh, St. Paul's College. I'm very honored by your invitation to contribute to the Hanley Memorial uh, Lecture Series uh, this evening and again tomorrow, and to reflect on the direction of the ecumenical movement in the 21st century in light of Pope Francis' invitation to renew our commitment and move forward together on the path to Christian unity. During a celebration held at St. Paul outside the walls to mark the close of the week of prayer for Christian unity in January of this year, Pope Francis declared, to journey together 
is already to be making unity. He went on to say, unity will not come as a miracle at the end. Rather, unity comes about in the journeying. The spirit does this on the journey. If we do not walk together, if we do not pray for one another, if we do not collaborate in the many ways that we can in this world for the people of God, then unity will not come about. But it will happen on this journey in each step that we take. Referring to the promotion of Christian unity as an essential dimension of his ministry as the Bishop of Rome, Pope Francis has pledged to carry forward the efforts of prayer, dialogue, and common witness in service to the growth towards full ecclesial unity of all Christians, a work that was begun in the Catholic Church from the Second Vatican Council and that was at the center of concern for his predecessors. Cardinal Walter Casper, a German theologian and former president of the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, has observed that from the first day of his pontificate, Pope Francis has given a prophetic interpretation of the Council and has inaugurated a new phase of its reception. In his apostolic exhortation on the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis calls upon Catholics today to undertake a wide-ranging pastoral and missionary conversion of the church, echoing the principal orientations of the Second Vatican Council. His project for ecclesial reform and conversion will have a profound impact on the direction of Catholic ecumenical commitment for the 20, for 20th, 21st century. Later this year, we will mark a particularly significant anniversary, the 50th since the publication of the Second Vatican Council's Decree on Ecumenism, Unitatis Red Integratio, on November 21st of 1964. It was published together with the Council's dogmatic constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, and the decree on the Eastern Churches belonging to the Catholic Communion, Orientalium Ecclesiarum. Most Catholics understand the Second Vatican Council as an important moment of reform and renewal in the life of the Catholic Church. Pope, John's, uh, Pope John XXIII's call for an aggiornamento or updating of the Catholic Church in the mid 20th century caught the imaginations of many. They are less likely to recall, however, that John XXIII chose quite deliberately to announce the Council on January 25th of 1959 during the week of prayer for Christian unity, or that the Council's goal, one of equal importance and closely related to that of updating, was the reestablishment of full visible unity with other Christians. Next to the growing awareness of the dignity of the human person, Pope John XXIII named the ecumenical movement as one of the most important developments to which the church must attend in order to carry out its mission in the modern world. In his vision for the council, reflected in several key speeches, the pastoral renewal of the Catholic Church, or a deepening fidelity to its own identity, would bring it closer to other Christian churches. Cardinal Augustin Bea, president of the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity, which was founded to oversee the ecumenical dimension of the Council's work, would insist that even if the goal of full visible unity was not immediately within reach, for Pope John, unity was the ultimate goal of the Council. So in what follows, I'd like to reflect on the Second Vatican Council as an historic turning point in the relationship among Christian churches. I will revisit the grounding of our ecumenical commitment in the Council's teaching 
and some of the key developments achieved through dialogue in the last 50 years. Finally, I'll propose a few tentative thoughts as to how we might heed Pope Francis' call to carry forward its central teachings on ecumenism in the 21st century in a substantially different social and cultural context and where the face of global Christianity has undergone a dramatic evolution. So the first part of my paper, the Second Vatican Council, a turning point in the history of global Christianity. The Second Vatican Council represents an historic turning point, not only for Catholicism. I would argue it marks also as well a decisive change in the life of other Christian churches, most of whom sent official observers to participate in the council proceedings. Scholars from across disciplines are virtually agreed that Vatican II stands as the most significant event in the last century of religious history. Following this historic meeting, which gathered together the bishops of the Global Catholic Communion of Churches for a period of several months each year from 1962 to 1965, many other churches embarked upon a broad program of reforming their teachings, ways of worship, ministerial structures, and canonical and dis disciplinary practices, often inspired by the example of the Catholic Church and informed either directly or indirectly by its teaching. Vatican II marked the end of centuries of isolation and began a long process of rebuilding mutual understanding and trust between estranged members of the Christian family. Through this process, we have made many surprising discoveries concerning the faith that we share. At the same time, we've learned to receive much from one another. All of our churches have been renewed. It's worth recalling the pastoral purpose of the aggiornamento envisioned by Pope John XXIII, this updating of the church's life and practice was not simply an accommodation to the culture of modernity, a culture long resisted by the Catholic Church. John XXIII called upon Catholics everywhere to update the life of the church so that it might proclaim the gospel message with greater effect. Far from abandoning the teaching of Christ, this wide-ranging effort at, of renewal would require a concerted effort of returning to the sources. The tradition found in the ancient sources would be reappropriated and expressed in a language and form that might be more plainly understood by modern people. In the half century preceding the Second Vatican Council, scholars had engaged in the renewal of biblical, patristic, and liturgical studies and had begun to uncover in the common sources of the Christian tradition the bases for a renewed understanding of their common faith. Through a common return to the sources of the Christian scriptures and to a tradition that predates the historic separation of the churches, Christian theologians began to reverse the effects of centuries of isolation. Closed confessional theologies developed in a defensive and sometimes hostile tone began to give way to common foundations of practice and belief. Movements of theological and liturgical renewal were ecumenical in themselves and nourished the organized effort of theological dialogue aimed at overcoming doctrinal divisions represented uh, from the earliest times in the Faith and Order Movement, which was founded in 1927. While Catholic authorities were initially quite skeptical towards the development of modern biblical and theological studies, and summarily rejected the initial overtures of ecumenical leaders to join the ecumenical movement, 
which began without Catholic participation much earlier in the 20th century. By mid-century, Pope Pius XII recognized this ecumenical movement as a fruit of the Holy Spirit and authorized the participation of Catholic scholars in ecumenical meetings. The concerted efforts of many Catholic theologians prior to Vatican II, including the international meetings called the Catholic Conference on Ecumenical Questions, organized by the young Dutch priest, Johannes Willebrands, prepared the ground for the full integration of ecumenical concerns into the agenda of Vatican II. Cardinal Bea was aided by Willebrands in the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity, founded in 1960 by Pope John XXIII, to facilitate the participation of official observers in the council proceedings. They worked tirelessly with a very competent team of experts to draft some of the most significant documents of Vatican II, the Decree on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae, the Decree on Ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, and the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions, Nostra Aetate. In addition to these texts, which provide the principal orientations for Catholic engagement in dialogue and mission, members of the Secretariat for Unity worked together with the Doctrinal Commission of the Council to draft the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, Dei Verbum, a document that treats an issue of central importance for ecumenism, the relationship between scripture and tradition, or the normative role of scripture in the discernment of church teaching. The full entry of the Catholic Church into the organized ecumenical movement at Vatican II required an adjustment in the conception of Catholic self-identity a subtle shift away from a narrow and exclusive identification of the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church, and away from an ecumenism of return, is evident in the spirituality of the week of prayer for Christian unity. The original octave of prayer for unity was established in 1908 by the founder of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement, Father Paul Watson. It originally consisted in the recitation of daily prayers for the return of other Christians to the unity of the Catholic Church. In 1935, Abbe Paul Couturier proposed another approach. He was convinced of the need, not simply for Catholics to pray for the conversion of others, but for all Christians to be converted more fully to Christ. Inspired by the model of Christ's prayer, in John 17, verse 21, that all his disciples be made one, Couturier proposed that all Christians pray together for the unity that Christ desires. This approach, which he calls the uh, spiritual ecumenism, and which the decree on ecumenism refers to as the soul of the whole ecumenical movement, entailed a subtle ecclesiological shift. Like the Venerable Bede, Couturier understood that the closer Christians or diverse Christian churches moved towards Christ, like the spokes on a wheel, the closer they would move to one another. Couturier's vision was not centered on Catholicism. Instead, it is Christ-centered. He argued, for a spirituality based not on the conversion of individual Christians to a single confessional church, but on the corporate conversion of the churches, so that each and all together would become more fully church. In Couturier's vision, common prayer for Christian unity was inseparable from the task of theological dialogue and conversion in the life and practice of the churches. Soon after he began promoting this new approach to the week of prayer, Couturier began to organize an annual retreat for Catholic priests and Protestant pastors, which combined times of prayer 
and friendly exchanges. Here, Lutheran, Reformed, and Catholic ministers and theologians developed a better knowledge and appreciation of one another's traditions and began to discover surprising areas of theological agreement. Remember, this is the 1930s and the 1940s. This was quite a remarkable initiative. This experiment in common prayer and theological dialogue helped to prepare the way for Catholic participation in officially mandated dialogues following Vatican II. The Groupe des Dombes, as they are still called today, produced some of the earliest theological agreements on questions such as the theology of ministry, Eucharistic doctrine, the ministry of the Bishop of Rome, the role of Mary in the prayer and teaching of the church, and teaching authority. Its members continue to carry forward Couturier's vision today, working to identify areas of theological convergence, as well as those areas of church doctrine and practice that stand in need of conversion. The ecumenical movement is essentially a movement for the renewal and the reform of all churches. These early pioneers grasped instinctively the intrinsic connection between theological dialogue and ecclesial reform. The Jesuit historian John O'Malley observes that the teaching of Vatican II can be distinguished from that of previous ecumenical councils by its engaging style, and discourse. Previous ecumenical councils had understood themselves primarily as legislative events whose decisions were written in short declarative decrees and punctuated with anathemas. In contrast, the documents of Vatican II are written in a more discursive and dialogical style. They are full of what O'Malley calls horizontal words, like brother and sister, people of God. Reciprocity words, like cooperation, partnership, and collaboration. Or friendship words, the human family. Humility words, pilgrim people. One of the most important words in the council documents is dialogue. O'Malley writes, dialogue manifests a radical shift from the prophetic I say unto you style that earlier prevailed and indicates something other than unilateral decision making. There is scarcely a page in the council documents on which dialogue or its equivalent does not occur. Pope Paul VI who succeeded to John XXIII following the first session of Vatican II in June of 1963, provided a guiding vision for the Council in his first and often neglected yet programmatic encyclical letter on the mission of the Church, Ecclesiam Suum, published in August of 1964. He proposes here that the language and practice of dialogue become the like motif of the Council's teaching. Pope Paul's threefold program for the Second Vatican Council and for the subsequent activity of the Church was centered on a deeper self-understanding of the Church, in particular of its nature and mission. A heightened consciousness of the identity of the Church, he insisted, must include an understanding of its rootedness in Christ with a healthy realism about the dissonance between the ideal image of the church intended by Christ and the actual image presented by the community of believers in the world today. That honest and humble self-examination must lead the church to the second element of Pope Paul's blueprint, a commitment to undertake whatever reforms are deemed necessary for the renewal of its life and witness. The work of metanoia, or conversion, was to be a principal feature of the Council's task of updating the Church. 
Further, Pope Paul argued, the ongoing renewal of the Pilgrim Church must become a permanent concern as it grows in its understanding of the gospel and fidelity to its message. The third course of action in Pope Paul's overarching vision is dialogue, friendly dialogue. And he saw this in a, a series of concentric circles that meant engagement in dialogue with humanity and culture, engagement in dialogue with non-believers and non-Christian religions, and engagement with other Christians. The most fully developed reflection on the actual process of dialogue in the Council's teaching appears in its decree on ecumenism. Here, dialogue is linked explicitly to the other two elements of Pope Paul's program, that humble self-examination and reform. The decree tells us that through dialogue, everyone gains a truer knowledge and more just appreciation of the teaching and religious life of both communions. This implies that dialogue is a means to help each church gain a deeper understanding, not only of the other, not only of the partner church in dialogue, but also of their own ecclesial self-identity. The process of dialogue seeks to, quote, acknowledge and esteem the truly Christian endowments from our common heritage, unquote, present in other churches. Further, it should lead Catholics to carefully examine themselves and undertake whatever reform and renewal is required so that the life of church might become more faithful to the gospel. The decree on ecumenism underlines that Catholics must be the first to remove any obstacles to unity that may be found in our own ways of living, even in the manner of the church's teaching. Further, it recognizes that because we are a pilgrim community of redeemed sinners, the task of reform is a continual process. The image of the church as people of God, which occupies a central place in the dogmatic constitution on the church, has restored an eschatological horizon against which Catholics, and indeed all Christians, are called to appreciate the dynamic character of ecclesial identity. The Constitution on the Church says that the Church will attain its full perfection only in the glory of heaven when there will come the time of the restoration of all things. We remain a community that is on the way. In the words of uh, the Constitution on Divine Revelation, always moving towards the fullness of the divine truth until the words of God reach their complete fulfillment in her. Not yet in full possession of the truth, we are always growing and being shaped by new understanding and new insights into the mystery revealed in Jesus Christ. So there's this observable shift in Catholic self-understanding in the teaching of Vatican II where Pope Pius XII's 1943 encyclical Mystici Corporis had uncritically identified the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of the creed with the Roman church, Vatican II's dogmatic consti constitution on the church recognizes that the one church of Christ is present and operative in many other churches and ecclesial communities albeit in varying degrees. Its vision is no longer centered exclusively on Rome, but is now Christ-centered. Notably, the documents of Vatican II refer, refrain from referring to the church as Roman Catholic. This reflects a deeper appreciation for the diversity of the Catholic communion of churches, which includes not only the Latin church but 22 autonomous Eastern Catholic churches that trace their origins to the Byzantine, Antiochian, Armenian, Alexandrian, and Chaldean traditions. Further, it, shifts, it reveals a shift away 
from a notion of ecclesial unity that had confused unity and uniformity, or conformity with the social and cultural form of the Western or Latin Catholic Church. The Dominican ecclesiologist Yves Congar rightly observed that centuries of isolation had led many Catholic theologians to confuse Catholicity and Romanicity. Vatican II set us on the course to rediscover the true sense of Catholicity, uh, acknowledging that the sin of division prevents the church from manifesting the fullness of that Catholicity or from realizing the whole of God's plan for the church and the human community. Vatican II embraced a vision of ecclesial unity that has since been characterized as a communion of diverse churches bound together by a common faith that is enriched by a legitimate diversity of expression in liturgy, theology, spirituality, and canonical structure. The Council seeks to affirm the communion that we already share in Christ, beginning from the sacramental bond of baptism through which all Christians are incorporated into the one Church of Christ. The decree on ecumenism acknowledges that the churches have at times followed different methods and have developed differently their understanding and confession of God's truth. It does not hesitate to affirm that from time to time, one tradition has come nearer to a full appreciation of some aspect of a mystery of revelation than the other, or has expressed it to better advantage. And it observes, in such cases, these various theological expressions are to be considered as mutually complementary rather than conflicting. This suggests the Catholics might learn and receive from other Christian communities, an insight that Pope Francis is anxious to repeat. The fundamental shift of Vatican II that I've been attempting to describe might best be characterized as a shift from an ecumenism of return to an ecumenism of recognition. In particular, the recognition and esteem for the many gifts of God's spirit that reflect a genuine communion in faith with other churches. In this next part of my paper, I want to turn to reflect on what progress, what signs of progress we have seen in the last 50 years since the Council. Already during the Second Vatican Council, plans were set in place for the Catholic Church to participate fully in the multilateral dialogue of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches and to establish a series of bilateral church-to-church -church dialogues. Since the Council, Catholics have been engaged in officially mandated dialogue with Orthodox, Anglican, Lutheran, Reformed, Methodist, Disciples of Christ, Baptist, Mennonite, Evangelical, and Pentecostal. I'm sure I'm missing a few <laughs> groups. Uh, groups um, at the international, national, regional, and local levels. The very fact that Christians can today engage in such an undertaking implies a dramatic shift from considering one another's positions as simply heretical or erroneous. Dialogue begins from the basic supposition that the doctrinal achievements of each church, even if we pers persist in a concern that they might be deficient in some way, nonetheless represent a sincere effort to receive the word of God in fidelity to Christ. So we always begin from a presupposition of goodwill. In dialogue, we listen to hear, beyond the divergent doctrinal expressions of our partner, a reception of the revealed word, word of God that binds us together. The painstaking effort of dialogue over many decades has enabled us to affirm significant levels of doctrinal agreement. 
Uh, it's impossible to summarize all of this, but three examples stand out for their ability to recognize a basic agreement in the truths of faith beyond a legitimate diversity of expression in the language of doctrine and prayer. The first of these concerns our common confession of faith in Christ. Popes Paul VI and John Paul II have signed significant affirmations of agreement on the confession of faith in Christ as true God and truly human with several Oriental Orthodox churches, namely the Coptic Orthodox Church, the Assyrian Church of the East, and the Malankara Assyrian Church of India. In doing so, they have overcome disagreements on the doctrine of the fourth century Council of Chalcedon. While consistent with the conciliar teaching, these joint confessions of faith give priority to the meaning of Chalcedon over its dis disputed language. The Jesuit theologian Bernard Sesbue observes that in this agreement, the Catholic Church shows itself capable of reconciling on fundamentals, really the core of our confession of faith in Christ, passing beyond the language canonized by the most celebrated conciliar definition. Perhaps the clearest expression to date of an agreement that takes our doctrinal plurality of expression into account, and one that will undoubtedly serve as a model for future ecumenical conversations, is to be found in the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification by faith, signed in 1999 by representatives of the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church. The joint declaration adopted an approach referred to as differentiated consensus. This agreement was widened to include the Methodist World Council in Seoul, South Korea in July of 2006. The joint declaration on justification by faith shows how agreement on the basic truths of this doctrine enables the churches to consider the remaining differences of language, theological elaboration, and emphasis in the understanding and explication of Lutheran and Catholic e expressions of faith in a new light. Past theological achievements, in particular, the doctrinal condemnations of each tradition are judged in light of this new consensus. The statement says, quote, the teaching of the Lutheran churches presented in this declaration do not fall under the condemnations of the Council of Trent. The condemnations in the Lutheran confessions do not apply to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church presented here in this declaration, unquote. Similarly, the horizon of common understanding establishes the framework within which future expressions of Lutheran and Catholic doctrine must be developed. In these conversations, the attention of Catholics has been drawn in a new way to the centrality of the doctrine of justification in the Pauline corpus of the New Testament. For their part, Lutherans will be more attentive in the future to the transformative power of justifying grace and to the act of participation of the faithful in response to God's free gift of grace. The final example I want to present here um, is a historic precedent that was set in the year 2001 when official guidelines were established for Eucharistic sharing between the members of the Assyrian Church of the East and the Chaldean Catholic Church. This agreement was developed in the face of pressing pastoral concerns for Christians living in the dramatic circumstances of conflict and in the isolation of the diaspora. So these are uh, very ancient communities whose uh, traditional home is in the area of ancient Persia or Iraq.
its uh, most striking feature is the recognition of the validity of an ancient Eucharistic rite, the anaphora of Adai and Mari, which does not include a recitation of the institution narrative, something long considered central to the intention of the Eucharistic prayer. In this case, Catholic authorities arrived at a judgment that even with this significant difference in the form of the Eucharistic prayer, the Assyrian Church of the East does what the church intends to do each time it commemorates the death and resurrection of the Lord, and it has preserved full Eucharistic faith. This agreement is an important example of how contrasting forms of prayer might come to be considered as complementary expressions of the same basic truths of faith. And to my knowledge, it's the only example in recent history where Catholic leaders were moved into action out of pastoral concern. There have also been many other areas where there's been limited progress, uh, where there hasn't been the, this uh, full authoritative recognition of full agreement. Um, but on many other uh, areas, once considered divisive, significant advances have been achieved, uh, even if there hasn't been a full formal reception or mutual recognition by church authorities. I'm thinking here of the significant agreements on Eucharistic doctrine concluded by the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, or ARCIC, and the Lutheran Roman Catholic Joint Commission. Growth in understanding the nature of ordained ministry and the importance of episcopate or oversight has led to the establishment of full communion between Anglicans and Lutherans in Europe and North America. The concrete reception of Eucharistic agreement within the Catholic Church has been stalled by the non-recognition of ministries. Although great strides have been made towards a shared understanding of ordained ministry, this progress has been eclipsed since the mid-70s by new disagreements relating to the ordination of women. Throughout the 1970s, significant agreements were concluded on questions of sacramental theology. The fruits of these are summarized in the 1982 document on Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry prepared by the Commission on Faith and Order, where Catholic theologians now participate as full members. When the six volumes of official responses to BEM, Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, uh, were compiled, they had official reception process in all the churches, it became clear from these responses that while the churches share deeply in their understanding of the sacraments, they're often prevented from fully recognizing the sacramental life of others by disagreement on matters of ecclesiology, questions pertaining to the structuring of ministries, and perhaps more fundamentally, to the exercise of authority and ways of decision-making. While these matters are less central in the hierarchy of truths, another principle of, of uh, ecumenical dialogue set out in the decree on ecumenism, uh, more central than the confession of the Trinitarian and, Trinitarian and Christological faith, they cannot be easily discounted, for they have to do with how it is that we discern the faith of the gospel and the re appropriate response of the church in changing contexts. And beneath these structural questions is the fundamental question of unity in faith and the structuring of ecclesial communion. Since the 1990s then, many official dialogues have focused on studies of ecclesiology, including the understanding of the church as communion and structures of authority and decision making. The fruits of these conversations are reflected in the most recent statement of the Faith and Order Commission, The Church Towards a Common Vision, a document submitted to the churches in 2013 
for their official reception. When we read in the preface, sorry, we read in the preface to this document, and I quote, in the long process from 1993 to 2012, so this is a document, imagine 120 representatives, theologians from all Christian denominations have worked over 20 years to, to work out this consensus statement. In this long process, the theological expressions and ecclesial experiences of many churches have been brought together in such a way that the churches reading this text may find themselves challenged to live more fully the ecclesial life. Others may find in it aspects of ecclesial life and understanding which have been neglected or forgotten, and others may find themselves strengthened and affirmed. While it would be impossible to do justice to this study, and indeed to the many thoughtful ecumenical studies produced in the area of ecclesiology over more than two decades, in the time remaining, I propose to focus on a number of areas where it can be said that the ecumenical movement might be seen as receiving some of the most important insights into the understanding of the church that were advanced at the Second Vatican Council. The vision of the church reflected in towards a common vision is one rooted in the dynamics of a Trinitarian communion, signified in the recognition of baptism and Eucharistic sharing, and guided by a ministry of episcopate or oversight at every level of ecclesial life in the service of unity and mission. These dialogues continue to challenge the Catholic Church. They call on us to better appropriate a number of important aspects of ecclesial life that we have historically neglected. While Vatican II may have drawn our attention to these, we have yet to fully receive them or give concrete expression to them in our ecclesial life. Three areas stand out. First, the, the papacy or the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. Second, the collegial exercise of the Episcopal office as an expression of communion between the local churches. And third, the dignity of the laity. So in this next section of my paper, I want to reflect briefly on these three uh, aspects of uh, Catholic uh, uh, practice and uh, how important they are for our ecumenical agreement. So the first is the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. It's no secret that one of the greatest stumbling blocks to full visible unity is the papacy, or more specifically, the present form of this ministry. Uh, Pope Paul VI made a trip to Geneva after the council in 1967, and he went to visit the World Council of Churches, and he said, well, here I am, I recognize, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the great stumbling blocks uh, to unity. Dialogue with Orthodox, Anglican, and Lutheran Christians has led us to a shared recognition of the necessity for a ministry of communion within a worldwide church, founded on the biblical witness and the historical role of Peter and his successors in the Church of Rome. Nonetheless, these churches continue to have serious reservations regarding the historical form of the papacy as it has evolved since the Middle Ages, in particular uh, with regard to its claim of universal jurisdiction. The faith and order document on the church toward a common vision of the church is one of the first World Council of Church studies to give attention to this question. So there's a long gap between that visit, visit of Paul VI and the moment when they're actually able to engage in this question theologically. And in doing so, they're building on the work of many bilateral dialogues. The document says the following. 
partly because of the progress already recorded in bilateral and multilateral dialogues, the Fifth World Conference on Faith and Order raised the question of a universal ministry of Christian unity. In his 1995 encyclical, Ut Unum Sint, Pope John Paul II quoted this text when he invited other church leaders and their theologians to, quote, enter into patient and fraternal dialogue, unquote, with him in this ministry. In subsequent discussion, despite continuing areas of disagreement, some members of other churches have expressed an openness to considering how such a ministry might foster the unity of local churches throughout the world and promote, not endanger, the distinctive features of their witness. All would agree that any such personal primatial ministry would need to be exercised in communal and collegial ways. This affirmation is a remarkable development for its recognition of an openness to a universal ministry of communion. Recently, Pope Francis has acknowledged that while much study has been carried out since Pope John Paul II's historic invitation to dialogue and, and uh, to the discernment of what is essential to this ministry, it has not been matched by any substantial change in structure and practice. In his apostolic exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis writes, we have made little progress in this regard. The papacy and the central structures of the universal church also need to hear the call to pastoral conversion. Pope Francis has already shown in his humble style and stated publicly um, his intention to carry out a substantial conversion in the manner in which papal authority is exercised. He has announced plans to reform the structures of the Roman Curia and the International Synod of Bishops with a view to establishing a better balance between the center and the periphery or the local churches. Pope Francis has acknowledged that this conversion to the of the papacy will require a more collegial and synodal structuring of church governance and leadership. He has already begun to reform the International Synod of Bishops, first established by Pope Paul VI as an instance of collegiality in the governance of the universal church. Pope Francis wants to make the synod more of a permanent instrument of dialogue and collaboration. His appointment of a council of eight cardinals from every continent, including a representative of the Eastern Catholic Churches, can be seen as another initiative aimed at improving communication with the local churches. The need to recover a balance between primacy and the collegial nature of the Episcopal office is a theme repeated often in ecumenical studies on the exercise of authority and church teaching. Pope Francis envisions a greater devolution of discernment to the bishops who are closer to the people and more attuned to their pastoral needs and to their differing cultural contexts. He writes, the Second Vatican Council stated that like the ancient patriarchal churches, Episcopal conferences are in a position to contribute in many and fruitful ways to the concrete realization of the collegial spirit. Yet this desire has not been fully realized since a juridical status of Episcopal conferences, which would see them as subjects of specific attributions, including genuine doctrinal authority, has not yet been sufficiently elaborated. Excessive centralization, rather than proving helpful, complicates the church's life and her missionary outreach. Many are encouraged by these words and are watching to see how they're met with concrete action. Any initiative to restore a balance between the College of Bishops and papal primacy or between concerns of the local churches 
and those of the universal church will have profound consequences for the structuring of communion among the churches as they grow together toward full visible unity. The complex question of the structuring of communion in a culturally diverse worldwide confessional family is one that confronts every church in today's globalized world. This is not just an internal Catholic concern. Since the Second Vatican Council, the global Catholic community has doubled in population. A half century ago, the center of gravity in global Catholicism could still be found in Europe and North America. Today, two thirds of Catholics reside in the global south, principally in Brazil, Mexico, and the Philippines. The election of a Latin American Pope is symbolic of this shift. The largest Anglican community today is found in Nigeria and the highest concentration of Lutherans outside of Europe is centered in East Africa. The churches face many of the same challenges as they strive to find ways of structuring communion that will permit us to discern together the demands of unity and faith while respecting and welcoming the distinctive gifts of local churches in diverse social and cultural contexts. The focus on these inner tensions in each confessional family has at times distracted our attention from the urgent task of seeking unity with others. Yet this may be one of the areas where we have the most to learn and receive from one another or to practice what Dr. Paul Murray has called receptive ecumenism. Pope Francis has often repeated that Catholics need to learn from the experience of collegiality and synodality in the Orthodox churches, as an example. My third example relates to the participation of the laity in the church. This is a theme that often lies in the background of discussions relating to the exercise of authority and decision making. It touches on the dignity of the baptized lay faithful, an important insight of the Second Vatican Council. In the exercise of their teaching office, bishops, including the Bishop of Rome, are responsible to teach and give expression to the faith of the whole church a faith that is born in the hearts of all the baptized. Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on the church recognized the significant role of the sensus fidelium, or the sense of faith, the charism given to every Christian and to all of them together through the anointing of God's spirit in baptism, in the exercise of their pastoral teaching office. The sensus fidelium is a charism of discernment, a capacity to recognize the truth of the gospel given to all those who seek to follow Christ faithfully. Most ecumenical studies recognize the importance of the concerted ener energies of all the baptized in the elaboration and reception of church teaching. Yet one finds little attention to the structured interaction of the ordained and lay faithful. Perhaps this is because the question of the laity was not a cause for the separation of the churches. A, a church that is widely recognized, however, as suffering from an underdeveloped practice and reflection upon the synodal dimension of ecclesial life would clearly stand to learn from other churches in this regard. Because of this gift of the spirit, ARCIC, the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, in its agreed statement, the gift of authority, recognizes that the laity must play an integral part in decision-making in the church. Reflecting on the dynamic exchange that must characterize relations between bishops and the laity, ARCIC states, those who exercise episcopate in the body of Christ must not be separated from the symphony of the whole people of God in which they have their part to play. They need to be alert to the sensus fidelium in which they share if they are to be made aware when something is needed for the well-being and mission of the community 
or when some element of the tradition needs to be received in a fresh way. Since the Second Vatican Council, lay people have assumed many new roles in ecclesial ministries, and the baptized faithful have developed a deeper sense of their co-responsibility for the life and witness of the church. Yet many lay Catholics have yet to experience themselves as participating in any serious dialogue that would affect the shape of ecclesial life or its priorities and mission. Pope Francis has acknowledged the challenge of greater inclusion of the gifts of the laity. He writes, and again this is from uh, his exhortation on the joy of the gospel, lay people are, put simply, the vast majority of the people of God. The minority, ordained ministers, are at their service. There has been a growing awareness of the identity and mission of the laity in the church. We can count on many lay persons, although still not nearly enough, who have a deeply rooted sense of community and great fidelity to the tasks of charity, catechesis, and the celebration of the faith. At the same time, a clear awareness of this responsibility of the laity, grounded in their baptism and confirmation, does not does not appear in the same way in all places. In some cases, it is because laypersons have not been given the formation needed to take on important responsibilities. In others, it is because their particular ch in their particular churches, room has not been made for them to speak and act due to an excessive clericalism which keeps them away from decision making. Pope Francis readily acknowledges that this concern extends to the participation of women in the life of the church. Recognizing that many women contribute to the pastoral life of the church and to its theological reflection, he expresses the hope that still broader opportunities might be created for a more incisive female presence in the church, including in settings where important decisions are made. It's important for Catholics to recognize that these are questions, that these questions are not simply internal matters. The participation of the lay faithful is directly related to the challenge of finding an, ecumenical, an ecumenically receivable exercise of discernment and decision making, and ultimately to the structuring of unity in the church that we seek to share with others. How we respond to these questions, indeed, the decisions taken by all churches today will have profound consequences for the shape of our unity or disunity in the years to come. No church has the resources to answer these questions in isolation. Our churches need one another. Everything we succeed in doing together today will help us to develop the habits of living in communion and prepare us for the day when our churches will be fully reconciled. At the same time, learning to discern together what the Spirit is asking of our churches will move us closer to an expression of faith that is in tune with the sense of faith of the whole church. We will be stronger if we walk this path together, and each step of the journey has the potential to become another step towards fuller unity. This thumbnail sketch doesn't really do justice to the richness and complexity of the story of how Catholics have been growing together in unity with other Christians in these 50 years since the Second Vatican Council. I hope it helps to share how, to show how the principles of ecumenical commitment set out by the Second Vatican Council have borne much fruit and must continue to guide our efforts of dialogue and ongoing reform in the 21st century. The examples that I've chosen to illustrate our progress and continu continuing challenges have been chosen from the world of doctrinal dialogue. They've also focused on the concerns of the ecumenical mainstream, on the concerns of churches who share a common goal of full visible unity realized in a common confession of Trinitarian faith, a common baptism, mutually recognized ministries, Eucharistic sharing, and shared structures of discernment and decision-making. 
allow me to conclude with a final thought from Pope Francis, who has firmly grasped the importance of Christian unity for the mission of the church in the world today. The credibility of the Christian message, he says, would be much greater if Christians could overcome their divisions and the church could realize the fullness of Catholicity proper to her in those of her children who, though joined to her by baptism, are yet separated from full communion. We must never forget that we are pilgrims journeying alongside one another. This means that we must have sincere trust in our fellow pilgrims, putting aside all suspicion or mistrust, and turn our gaze to what we are all seeking, the radiant peace of God's face. Trusting others is an art, and peace is an art. Jesus told us, blessed are the artisans of peace. In this perspective, ecumenism can be seen as a contribution to the unity of the human family. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I thought what we'd do, uh, we have a reception at, at 8.30. We could take 15 minutes for questions. And I'll walk around with the microphone, and you can just grab it, and you can keep your questions short, and then Catherine uh, Clifford can respond to your questions. So we can start that way, is that fine? Um, you were speaking about a group in the 30s and 40s that were already working on ecumenism. And um, we were marveling over here because I remember my, uh, my brother's godfather saying that back in the 40s, Catholics and Protestants were still throwing stones at each other. So <laughs> can you tell me um, how big was this movement? Um, how, how, it was extremely discreet. <laughs> this, this, uh, the, the dialogue that I'm thinking of is uh, the Groupe des Dombes. And there's, the, okay, they're still working today. Their latest uh, document, uh, I think we're still waiting for an English translation, but it's a, a kind of common meditation on the Lord's Prayer. And it would be a great kind of resource for local ecumenical groups to think about the fact that we all say this prayer together, what consequences does it have for our living together? Um, but in the 19, well, this began in 1936. Um, they actually probably met in secret <laughs> because it, it, this was scandalous for many people, but they met with the full support of the local bishop, uh, who was Cardinal Gerlier, the Cardinal Archbishop of Lyon. And uh, beginning from 1942, in this little group, uh, I think they began probably as maybe a dozen men, and then it expanded to, to, to a couple dozen. And by the 1960s, they were 40 members, and that's as big as they could get because the room wouldn't hold more people. <laughs> and they also wanted to have a, a critical mass that was where a, a dialogue was really manageable. But imagine in the 1940s, what they wanted to do was, Protestants wanted to come and attend a Catholic Mass, just to see it. And Catholics wanted to attend a Protestant liturgy. This, this was, they didn't want to be seen by people in the villages where they were meeting because this could cause a lot of scandal. Uh, but they, they kept um, careful records of what they did, and they reported regularly to the authorities in their churches. And uh, by 1949, um, the first uh, visit, there was a first visit organized by the Cardinal of uh, Roger Schutz and Max Thurian, the two founders of the Taizé community, who were part of the dialogue, and they, they took a file with them, and they left this file with Pope Pius XII. So, so they were also trying to bring along people within the Vatican uh, about what, what they were learning through these meetings. And Johan Willebrands, who I mentioned also, was doing the same thing beginning in 1952 
organized these meetings and was meeting regularly with leaders of the World Council of Churches. And um, it was quite informative and quite a, a learning process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for, for your presentation. My name is Sandra Stewart, a sister of Our Lady of the Missions. I was struck by the sense of urgency that you said seeking unity uh, is. And maybe it's uh, obvious, but what would be the consequences of not seeking unity besides just the peril of the planet? In other words, everything needs to, you know, the whole thing of coming together. Um, what are the consequences if we don't have this dialogue? I think if we ignore the call to be reconciled with other Christians, we ignore the gospel. We need to understand, and I don't think enough Christians have understood the contradiction between saying, you know, um, yes, I, I embrace the faith in Christ, I want to proclaim this message of love and reconciliation, but I don't give a darn about being reconciled with my brother and sister in Christ, other baptized Christian. So it's just, in a sense, it's, it's not on <laughs> otherwise. To be the church, John Paul II said, to be church is to desire unity. To be Christian is to desire unity. And the other thing is, we cannot, with credibility, be witnesses in the world if, if we're not doing this together. And I think most of us understand today how important interfaith questions are in the geopolitical world and in the very religiously pluralistic uh, world of our cities now and our, our cultures because of the tremendous movement of peoples. But we will certainly be more effective in our conversation with believers of other faiths if we can speak together. Same thing. Um, it, it really goes to the heart of our mission and our witness in the world. <clears throat> With respect to that 1999 Joint Declaration Catholic Lutheran uh, statement on justification, uh, I heard someone say, with respect to the Protestant churches, that protest is now over. Uh, is that wishful thinking? Is that over? Like that is it really true? I think, I, th I think, I think if you, if you take seriously the centrality of the concern of Martin Luther and the Lutheran churches for their, their understanding of how central the doctrine of justification by faith is for them, to say that we have overcome this disagreement is profound. And it does take the protest out of Protestantism <laughs> in, a, in a real sense. Uh, what it also should do is it should put our dialogue on all those other issues, sacramental issues, questions of ministry, in a whole different framework. Because what, we're, what we've said is the underlying foundation, which pertains to how we understand the way God's grace works in the divine human relationship, we do not disagree. It's profound. It's really profound. And I don't know that we've really um, drawn the consequences of that uh, agreement as much as we should. The nitty gritty, uh, Eucharistic celebrations, um, funeral masses, uh, would you comment on the practice of uh, the need that some clergy have to interrupt the Eucharistic celebration and give a lengthy um, explanation of who can or cannot receive communion. It's, this, is a, this is where the rubber hits the road for a lot of people. For the 40% of Catholics in this country who marry Christians from other churches and who have to decide every Sunday where their family will worship. They, they have a deep desire to, to worship together. And um, many of my students are preparing for ordination or are serving in other ministries in the church. 
and they need to understand, doesn't matter what denomination you come from, if you preside today at a baptism or a wedding or a funeral or a confirmation celebration, you must recognize that there are other Christians present in the congregation. It's a fact of our ecclesial life. And so um, one of the questions that the Anglican and Roman Catholic bishops dialogue in Canada asked the theologians dialogue to study a number of years ago was this, could, could we make some recommendations about what would be a pas uh, an appropriate pastoral practice because some of what, get, what gets said on all, in, both, in all of our churches is experienced as very offensive. The difficulty is um, that it's very hard to give a resume uh, when you have you know, the 30 seconds before the distribution of communion of Canon 844 Article C. <laughs> and some people over, want to oversimplify and say, if you're not Catholic, you can't come to communion. We have this, it's, and that's quite incorrect, Catholic pastoral practice allows not for a regular general practice of sacramental sharing, but recognizes there are situations where it's quite legitimate for other Christians to ask for and receive not only communion, but also the sacrament of reconciliation and anointing for the sick from a Catholic minister. And one of those cases is some of these interchurch families. So it's up to the bishop to make clear what the, the policy, if they can, in a sense, institute a policy in the diocese. And my, my sense is where bishops have done so, it's been more helpful because it's not left to the discretion of individual pastors and individual communities to um, interpret this. So I don't know if, I, if that's helpful. Would, would it make more sense for that kind of, quote, explanation to happen before the liturgy begins? Yes. Rather than the interruption of yes. the flow of the Eucharist? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, 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 I think the simplest way to do it is to say something like, uh, those of you who are not receiving communion, we invite you to come forward and ask for a blessing. When I'm in an Anglican uh, parish, uh, or even when we meet for our Anglican Catholic dialogue and it's the turn of the Anglicans to celebrate the Eucharist, I will always approach, cross my hands and ask for a blessing. And it's, um, I think a little less painful than that awkward being left in the pews. Um, and uh, it's actually a practice that Anglican and Catholic bishops in the International Anglican Roman Catholic Commission on Unity and Mission, long name, but a, a kind of reception commission of Anglican Catholic bishops have, have been encouraging Anglicans and Catholics to, 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 yeah, to find a way of being hospitable within the parameters of existing church discipline. Other ca Catholics sometimes also feel unduly pressured to go to communion in other churches if, if, if it's not said clearly that the, the community there or the pastor in another church does not, is not asking people to go against the dis discipline of their own church. So it goes both ways. Thank you. Yes, uh, a long time ago when I was a student at TST, I took a course in ecumenism from the great Canadian church historian John Webster Grant. And the guest speaker one day was Gregory Bond, yeah. uh, who, as you know, was involved in the uh, Second Vatican Council and, and uh, was interested in ecumenism. And he said that the, at that time, and I just wanted to get your comment on this, that the thing that actually divided uh, the Christian community, now this would be 1975 or 76, uh, but the line that ran through the Christian community was not uh, between the denominations, but within the denominations uh, with respect to Christendom. Uh, those who saw Christendom expiring and saw it as an opportunity for new forms of faithfulness, and those who saw Christendom expiring and wanted to save it bring it back. 
repatriated or whatever the appropriate word is. Now, a lot has happened since then, and of course, you alluded to the fact that perhaps we have a new Christendom emerging in this global Christianity that leaves the kind of Eurocentric Christianity behind to some degree. But I wondered if you, I'd be interested in hearing your uh, comment on that uh, element of division or at least divergence or differing opinions uh, within the larger faith community. Sure. Um. Gregory was uh, an expert at Vatican II, uh, and he worked for the Secretariat for Christian Unity and was one of the drafters of the original document on the Jews that formed the basis of Nostra Aetate. Um, and it sounds just like a Gregory Baum question. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we could say the Second Vatican Council is a moment of an awakening of the Catholic consciousness of, to the fact of the end of Christendom. In a sense, a form of Christianity, the social form of Christianity that was Eurocentric and that saw um, this, you know, from the time of Constantine, this interdependence of church and state and, and looked for um, social structures to support and reflect the values of the church. Um, this was also quite common in European Protestantism into the beginning of the 20th century. Um, it's only the 19th century that free churches become a, more of a phenomenon, say, in, in, in Europe. So what happens, I think, at Vatican II is Catholics begin to understand, and they don't all come to understand this at the same time, and we could say that this, this might be true in other Christian communities and churches as well, that we no longer have a privileged place in society and in culture, uh, and that we can't count on social structures to reinforce the values that we bear, but the church for its mission, now the only, in a, in a sense, the only, um, if you want, power we have in society to promote the values and the mission of the church is the authenticity of our own witness. So that the, the way to proclaim the gospel is by the persuasiveness of our own witness. And I think that there's a natural insecurity that comes from that kind of a realization. And it's not surprising that there are tensions and fears um, and perhaps a desire to go back to a more comfortable time, uh, but I, I just don't think it's possible to return to that kind of a world. Other religions, we're seeing the transition of Islam today, or the transition in Buddhist communities, are also moving away from that kind of worldview, where there's a homogenous kind of view of the political and social world and the religious world. And so we're all struggling to deal today with the reality of religious pluralism and diversity. Catherine, I think we'll take one more question and we'll break for refreshments. So and I have someone over here and then we'll, then we get to individually buttonhole you for the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Um, what is the uh, best answer you can give to a person who it's hard to hear him. Okay, then you better get space if you want to do that. To help those who can hear well and understand well and all that. But the person like me would like to be in unity with the Christian, to be participating, involved, without being kind of like. Like, what does he know? What does he understand? Or what does, uh, in, in not being so judgmental, but to give the person an opportunity, a, a chance to grow in unity. How, what is your best response to that, for example? First, I want to, uh, um, affirm the importance of hard of hearing people in the church 
and in society. And I want to say that your place is as valuable as every other person. And so beyond that, uh, your place as uh, a baptized, baptized Christian, yeah, baptized Christian is, you have the same dignity and worth as every other Christian. So our communities and our churches have to uh, make the effort to be more inclusive and uh, to, uh, to welcome you and other hard of hearing people. Thank you, Dr. Clifford. And I, I want to thank St. Mary's uh, Academy for welcoming us all into this, into this group. I work for people of all different backgrounds, not just Catholics, but people of different denominations and different faiths in the audience here. Uh, one of the things that you bring as a talent to Winnipeg is your ability to do distance running. And, and so this, this is a, a St. Paul's College uh, jersey to wear outdoors. <laughs> so I hope you wear this with the apostrophe S. Yes, it's not St. Paul, it's St. Paul's. Uh, so I hope you, you get to enjoy it. So thank you very much.